Welcome, and thank you all for joining us today at the 31st Commission on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice side event on decis decisive action to reform laws that criminalize poverty and status. My name is Jennifer Smith. I am the Executive Director of the International Legal Foundation, and it is my great privilege to be moderating this important discussion here today. Interpretation for this event is available in English, French, and Portuguese. You can select your preferred language using the globe icon at the bottom of the screen. We have an incredibly distinguished panel of speakers here today who are going to shine a light on the many ways in which criminal justice systems around the world are criminalizing poverty, race, ethnicity, gender, and other status landing people behind bars, not for what they have done, but because of who they are. They will also discuss some actions that are being taken to address this injustice, including through court litigation and legislative reform. Most importantly, we expect our panelists to start a conversation between member states, UN bodies, and civil society actors that will set out clear goals and decisive action needed to decriminalize poverty and status linked to the Commission on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice and other international mechanisms and initiatives. Unfortunately, given the number of speakers, I don't think we will have time today for question and answers from our panelists. However, this event is just the beginning. We plan to have more discussions and opportunities for action around the decriminalization of poverty and status this year. So we encourage you to type your questions and comments into the chat box so they can be noted and help inform this ongoing work. Please also introduce yourselves. We'd love to see who's here, the diversity of participants. Um, it will also help us to keep you all informed in this year of action. This event is organized by the International Drug Policy Consortium with the support of the governments of Ghana, Mexico, South Africa, the United States, and the African Policing Civilian Oversight Forum, the Campaign to Decriminalize Poverty and Status, the Community Advice Office of South Africa, the International Legal Foundation, the Office of the High Commission for Human Rights, Open Society Foundations, Penal, for, Penal Reform International, and the UNODC Justice Section. Please note that this event is being recorded and will be available for replay. It is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Rachel Rossi, the Deputy Associate Attorney General of the US Department of Justice, who will provide opening remarks. As a former public defender, Ms. Rossi has witnessed the devastating connections between race, poverty, and injustice in the United States. And that the Department of Justice has been leading efforts to address this crisis nationwide. I am happy to announce that just yesterday, we heard that Ms. Rossi was appointed to lead a standalone office for access to justice at the Department of Justice that will be dedicated to the mission of closing these gaps. Ms. Rossi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you so much for your leadership on these issues. Um, good, after, good, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here on behalf of the United States Department of Justice and to join the many member states and civil society organizations that are participating uh, with a shared goal of equal justice under law for all. Our democracy in the United States is built upon the idea that the law, if applied fairly and impartially, can serve as a great equalizer and a powerful force for justice. But for people facing the reality of poverty or living paycheck to paycheck, a single incident whether a fine by a court or an outstanding warrant can lead to a cycle of profound problems that ruin lives and tear apart families. And all too often low-income communities closely intersect with communities of color. When staying in one's home, keeping one's children, obtaining a protective order to ensure safety or simply just to maintain liberty and freedom depend upon someone's status or wealth, the promises of justice ring hollow. The Justice Department is working to renew its commitment to equity and access to justice as a core and fundamental component of its mission. And today I would like to provide some brief updates on our work. First, pursuant to the president's first memorandum on racial equity, the Justice Department recently released its equity action plan, committing to the advance, advancing equity for marginalized and underserved communities in the US. 
The department's priorities include increasing access and opportunity in five key areas, federal financial assistance, grants, language access, stakeholder engagement, and contracting and procurement. Further, we know that indigenous communities, communities of color and low income communities are most affected by environmental harms and frequently face barriers to accessing the justice they deserve. For this reason, the department has created the first ever Office of Environmental Justice to address the public health harms caused by environmental crime, pollution and climate change. Associate Attorney General Vanita Gupta recently announced a comprehensive environmental justice enforcement strategy that will prioritize cases that have the greatest impact on these communities. In addition, the department is renewing a strong focus on promoting constitutional policing. Following a review led by Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco, the department announced written department-wide policies limiting the use of chokeholds and limiting the circumstances in which federal law enforcement components may enter private homes without first knocking and announcing themselves. The department also directed federal law enforcement personnel to wear act and, and activate body-worn cameras in specific circumstances to promote transparency and confidence in the department's work. In addition, the department recently announced the creation of a national law enforcement lab, a knowledge lab, a free training, technical assistance, and resource hub for law enforcement designed to promote constitutional policing, improve public safety, and build trust in communities across the country. It will build on multiple department initiatives to support best practices in policing. Talking a little bit about our work to combat hate crimes, the department's goal of ensuring racial equality includes reforms to prosecuting and deterring acts of hate. Hate crimes have risen to their highest level in nearly two decades, the majority of which, over 60% in the US, were motivated by race and ethnicity. Recent examples include the disturbing new pattern of hate crimes against Asian Americans that increased during the pandemic, the, during the pandemic and uh, also uh, just pause to um, recognize the victims and the community suffering after the mass shooting that occurred at a Buffalo supermarket last weekend. The department continues to vigorously investigate and prosecute hate crimes and incidents under criminal and civil laws. And we are using all of our non-enforcement resources and tools as well. And that includes funding, training, and community, community mediation to pursue a comprehensive and robust response to root out and eradicate hate. Finally, last October, Attorney General Merrick Garland announced the reestablishment of the Office for Access to Justice. The guiding principles of the revitalized and expanded Office for Access to Justice will lead the department's multi-layered response to racial inequity and will work to address the justice gaps created by poverty, language access, and other economic barriers. Among its priorities, the office will promote improved and equitable access to criminal justice and department initiatives by working with members of underserved communities to ensure that they are treated fairly and that their voices are and experiences inform the department's work. The office, the office will also lead the department's efforts to address the root causes of discrimination and overrepresentation in the criminal justice system through data collection study and research. The Office for Access to Justice will accelerate innovation by championing best practices and new strategies that promote fairness in our civil legal justice system. And collaboration like this is critical as we learn from you as well. We are also working to expand language access to department resources and tools in order to ensure we effectively reach and serve all of our communities. The Access to Justice Office will also partner with foreign governments and non-governmental organizations to revitalize U.S. global partnerships on access to justice, supporting the work of the U.N. Crime Commission and also supporting our work to comply with U.N. Sustainable Goal Development Goal 16. And finally, the Office for Access to Justice intends to address specifically economic barriers that stand in the way to justice, such as unaffordable fines and fees, cash bail and eviction and foreclosure proceedings that disproportionately punish poor people, people of low economic means, people of color and other vulnerable communities. In closing, Brian Stevenson, a well-known US civil rights lawyer said, I'm not persuaded that the opposite of poverty is wealth. I've come to believe that the opposite of poverty is justice. The department is, key, is deeply committed to taking all necessary steps and to partnering with you collectively to ensure that this promise of justice is real for all. This work is urgent and we must find tools to stand in the justice gap 
which is most often disproportionately felt by communities of color and low income communities. We have a great deal of work to do and we know that, but we are proud to join with you and with others in the international community who share our commitment and we look forward to a fruitful sharing of ideas and experiences from which we will all benefit. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rachel, both for acknowledging, of course, the deeply rooted racial injustice that exists in the United States and its intersection with, with economic inequality um, and what you're planning to do in, in your leadership position at the Office for Access to Justice to address these issues. I, I'm really excited about the U.S. Um, collaboration in the international space, and hopefully there will be opportunity going forward for you to share um, your learnings with other governments around the world. Next, I'd like to introduce Ju the Honorable Judge Makume, who is representing South Africa at this event. Judge Makume brings rich experience to this panel, both as chairperson of the Board of Directors of Legal Aid South Africa, which is you know, the lead public defender organization in South Africa representing poor and marginalized persons accused of criminal offenses, and as a judge of the High Court of South Africa, South Gauteng Division. As a judge, he has shown great courage addressing injustice, most recently in a judgment he handed down in March, in which he found that the police had killed a trade unionist in 1982 and must be held responsible for their actions. Judge Makume, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jennifer, and good afternoon to everybody. Um, my discussion with you today will more or less uh, dovetail what uh, Jennifer, <coughs> Jennifer has just indicated to you. As you all know, South Africa uh, may be classified as an upper middle class income country, but it remains amongst the most unequal, one of the most unequal societies in the world with very high income and wealth inequality and low intergenerational mobility remaining as marked legacies of the historic entrenchment of economic and social exclusion. Poverty in South Africa has very strong racial, gender, age, and spatial dimensions. A significant number of the population um, lack adequate access to basic social services such as health, uh, quality health care, safe water, and education. However, in South Africa, most of the cities and metros have laws that exist that have the effect of making the poorest and most marginalized people in society criminally responsible for their status by making it a criminal offense to perform life-sustaining activities in public spaces. This includes people who sleep, uh, who sleep in the open because of homelessness. This includes people who uh, stop at dead robots and intersections begging for money and food. We find a number of them from across the neighboring countries, Zimbabwe and Mozambique, and, and with young children standing at the street corners asking for money. Now those, the metros and the, cities, and the cities do not want to see people like that in the street corners and they take steps to remove them, at times detaining them uh, overnight for, for loitering. We fortunately have a Bill of Rights in our constitution, which we regard as a cornerstone of democracy in South Africa. Uh, that bill enshrines the rights of all people in our country, irrespective of their origin, whether they come from Zimbabwe or from, from, from Namibia. It affirms the democratic values of human dignity and equality and freedom that, is, that we have so much fought for. However, we do find that uh, of the, of the <clears throat> rights that are entrenched in the, in the Bill of Rights. It is a second generation rights that are most connected to social and economic features of life. South Africa is one of the only few countries in the world to entrench rights such as access to food, water, housing, healthcare, and social security. This you find in section 27 of the constitution, as well as children's rights to education uh, we should find in section 28. We, we have petty offenses which still exist for which people are still criminalized. Petty offenses refer to minor crimes for which the punishment is prescribed by law as a small fine or a short term of imprisonment. These include 
offenses like vagrancy laws, such as being a rogue, a vagabond, or an idle or a disorderly person, loitering, prostitution, and failure to pay debts. All these offenses are criminalized through laws which are not criminal in nature, but are created for the administration of such matters as the control of public nuances, municipal roads, public places, traffic and parking. And those laws criminalize informal commercial activities such as hawking and vending. We know that a large number of people who, are, who cannot find employment uh, resort to hawking and selling on the, on the street sides and at some of some of the street corners. Laws that criminalize petty offenses are inconsistent with the right to dignity and freedom from ill treatment on the basis that these laws contribute to overcrowding in places of detention. The enforcement of these laws significantly contributes to the number of people in police custody and pretrial detention and has an adverse effect impact on the enjoyment of other rights by detainees. This includes prolonged police custody because people are unable to afford to pay bail, to be released on bail. And they're exposed to overcrowded police detention, prison detentions, and then are exposed to ill health. It has become uh, even worse with the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, people, uh, people come out of those detentions having uh, been affected. Laws that criminalize petty offenses are often vague and overly broad and do not always spe specify the conduct being criminalized or the requisite criminal or intent. Consequently, law enforcement officials are given wide discretion to determine which activities constitute criminal behavior in a particular context which often results in the law being applied in an arbitrary and or discriminatory manner. Some police officers do, uh, or do arrest people who are found to be illegal in the country. And they, they make it a point themselves that uh, they take bribes and say that you have now paid me money, you can go and make sure that you don't get arrested again. As I've mentioned earlier on, Idle and disorderly, disorderly laws are usually enforced through police soups, which target people based on their status as sex workers or drug, or drug users. Although all these persons are marginalized, those targeted amongst them are those who are poor. The enforcement of these offenses is thus on the basis of economic status. Arresting a person based on their status as a sex worker or based on being poor amounts to unfair discrimination and unequal treatment before the law on the basis of economic and social status, which are protected under the constitution or constitution. Our courts have also found that soups of areas where homeless people are living and resulting in confiscation of and destruction of their properties have violated their due process and protections against unreasonable search and seizure. This you find mostly in squatter camps and people who do not have homes. Homelessness is a persistent social issue in our country. Homeless individuals often experience violence and victimization at disproportionate rates. They are frequently exposed to harsh treatment and often stripped of their basic constitutional rights. Homeless individuals are arguably among the most vulnerable people within our society or any society, yet the concept of the homeless victim remains absent from popular consciousness as well as from criminal justice system. Homeless individuals rarely report the experiences of victimization, which could be due to their lack of awareness of their legal rights or their unwillingness to assume victim status. A survey on the cost of homelessness in Cape Town revealed that on average, a homeless individual is arrested at least once every three years. To date here, however, there is no specialized legislative framework directed at addressing uh, victimization of the homeless in South Africa. The criminalization of homelessness is seen as an extension of the negative attitude held by society against members of the homeless population. Historically, homeless people have faced various forms of discrimination, both individually and perpetuated as state-based uh, 
institutions. For example, the criminalization of activities associated with homelessness, such as loitering or being in a public, uh, being a public menace due to their visibility in public spaces. Homeless people are often subjected to regulations that are interpreted by many as being discriminatory. In addition to an increase in the risk of victimization, there is also a tendency of members of the general public and law enforcement officials to criminalize this vulnerable social group. It is thus of utmost importance that the provisions of legislations that are currently used to exploit and further marginalize vulnerable groups in society should be challenged on the basis that these provisions are inconsistent with the constitution as they lead to the violation of the constitutional rights of marginalized groups due to their vulnerable uh, status. In conclusion, um, while this forum is providing us with the context we need to understand what needs to be done to decriminalize poverty and status, I would like to close with an urgent call for an international meeting of experts to address common ways in which the poor and marginalized are being criminalized worldwide and develop recommendations for action to address this crisis. We need to move beyond dialogue towards tangible strategies and solutions to ensure justice for all. I thank you. Thank you so much, Judge Mukume, both for acknowledging the deep injustice that exists in South Africa and your efforts to address it and calling for that expert group meeting. And I just wanna acknowledge that South Africa in 2014, similarly led an initiative to bring together legal aid providers from around the world to address the access to legal aid crisis that exists. Um, and that's turned into a biannual event. So I hope with your leadership, we can make this expert group meeting happen as well. It Thank is you, my, uh, thank you, Judge Mukume. It is my pleasure to introduce to you now our next speaker, Olivier Deschuteaux, who is the uh, United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. An expert on social and economic rights and on economic globalization and human rights, Mr. Deschuteaux has a unique understanding on the ways in which the poor and homeless are being criminalized around the world that I hope he will share with us today, um, acknowledging what has already been said in, uh, that is happening on the ground in South Africa and the United States. Mr. Deschuteaux, the floor is yours. Well, many thanks indeed, Jennifer, dear colleagues. It's a great pleasure to be here and thank you for organizing this important discussion on the occasion of the 31st session of the, the UN Commission on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice. Let me start by reminding all of us that this issue that we are discussing today, particularly the criminalization of poverty as one of the most striking examples of criminalization based on status has been revived by a judgment delivered um, a, a bit more than a year ago by the European Court of Human Rights in the case of La Catouche versus Switzerland. Uh, this was a judgment of 19th of January of 2021 uh, concerning a, a woman of Roma origin, um, Violetta La Catouche, who had been fined 500 Swiss francs for begging in a public space in Geneva. And uh, this is uh, an, an offense according to the the regulations in force in the uh, canton of Geneva. And since she couldn't pay, she was um, sentenced to five days of detention um, in remand um, for failure to pay the fine. The European Court of Human Rights considered that this was in violation of Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights and specifically the right to respect for private life that that norm um, embodies. Uh, despite the fact that some 29 states um, out of the then 47 member states of the Council of Europe have similar regulations in place. The finding of the court was that a person without work, without social aid, may have no other option than to resort to begging. And the court dismissed the arguments of Switzerland uh, that sought to defend the imposition of the fine and the sentencing to a jail um, sentence. Um, Switzerland alleged that this was needed to combat human trafficking um, and criminal networks, that the passersby were disturbed by the um, activity of begging, although Violetta Lacatouche was not aggressively begging, 
or harassing passersby. And uh, Switzerland had argued also that for the economic well being of Switzerland and the attractiveness of Geneva as a, a place where tourists uh, could be. Uh, could be um, lured to, to, to come, that may be a problem. And I think it, it is an important judgment and allowed my esteemed colleague, the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Adequate Housing, Balakrishnan Rajagopal, and myself to send a letter to all Council of Europe member states and to uh, a large number of um, organizations working um, um, with local governments to prepare what may become a, a, a comparative study on these offenses um, addressed um, um, or, or criminalizing, um, begging, loitering, or other such, um, such offenses. Um, and I'm very delighted that um, uh, Gunnar Thaisen from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, supporting my very dear friend um, Raj, um, the Special Rapporteur on Adequate Housing, is with us today. This is important because since many years, UN standards have been emphasizing that this kind of um, uh, criminalization of poverty is unacceptable. I refer here to the guiding principles on extreme poverty and human rights endorsed in September 2012 by the Human Rights Council. I refer also to the guidelines for the implementation of the right to adequate housing presented in December 2019, who together, send three important messages. First, all laws criminalizing life-sustaining life -sustaining activities in public spaces, sleeping, begging, eating, should be repealed. And this was reaffirmed by the Human Rights Council in um, a resolution it adopted in June 2020, resolution 43-14. Secondly, until such laws are repealed, at least local collectivities, law enforcement agencies should ensure that the non-payment of fines should not lead to prison sentences being imposed. And thirdly and finally, um, local authorities should prohibit forced eviction of homeless persons from public spaces and the destruction of their personal belongings. Indeed, they should respect the privacy of their home, or uh, one should say perhaps of wherever uh, homeless people are able to, to live. And I think these are important reminders that with um, Balakrishnan Rajagopal, we will try to um, push um, in, the next, in the next few months. Why is this important? I would like to emphasize three reasons why the criminalization of begging is of deep concern to us. First, it feeds stereotypes about people in poverty, people that if their um, activity as um, um, beggars, for example, is criminalized, are described as having chosen their condition and as being responsible for that condition and are described as being dangerous, a threat to society, a threat to law and order. So this feeds into the negative prejudices against the poor that, as we know, have a number of problematic consequences, not least that people in poverty will fear contacts with public authorities, will not dare to seek support, to seek help, and um, will um, try to remain invisible, shameful of their condition once what they do is it's considered a criminal offense. So that is the first, I think, major reason having to do with the symbolic message that the law sends why we should address the criminalization of poverty. The second reason is that all too often um, criminalizing uh, begging or other life-sustaining activities that people who are homeless uh, resort to is often a pretext for not addressing the structural causes of poverty, lack of economic opportunities, insufficient social support, unaffordability of housing. I take as one recent example of this, the decision by the municipality of Beirut to crack down on informal workers, street vendors, uh, shoe shiners, beggars in Beirut. And the statement we read from the municipality says the following, and I quote here, they say, with the worsening economic crisis that led to the increase and exacerbation of the phenomenon of begging, 
the presence of beggars on public spaces has, and I quote again, negatively impacted the movement of pedestrians, shop owners, restaurants, and others. Now, in a country such as Lebanon, where more than 80% of the population has fallen into multidimensional poverty, in which uh, people cannot pay for transport to school or to work, in which people now cannot pay for the bread that is their, um, their staple diet in the country because of the increased prices of wheat, it is quite unacceptable that instead of treating poverty as it must by fiscal reform and, and strengthening social protection, that we criminalize the activity of, of beggars, making um, uh, poverty as much as possible invisible, relegating it to the margins. And I think that um, recent example of the Beirut municipality is quite telling in this regard. Um, as we have an economic crisis, um, that is reaction we authorities have. This, I think, should be uh, considered um, very problematic, indeed unacceptable. The third reason why it's really important to address this is because of the vicious cycles between poverty and criminalization. Poverty, of course, leads people to be criminalized because they cannot um, uh, pay uh, certain, certain fines or even pay certain taxes because they cannot um, 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 live decently without resorting to activities that may be criminalized, such as begging. And as a result of being criminalized, this, these people are further marginalized and, and, and forced into poverty um, because they cannot um, um, have these activities very eloquently described by Judge Mukeme, um, but also because finding a job when you have a criminal record is extremely difficult uh, to do. So I think that is the third reason why we should be extremely wary of the fact that these petty offenses often inherited from the colonial period um, remain on, on the statute books. And so for all these reasons, together with um, uh, Balakrishnan Rajagopal, the special rapporteur on the right to adequate housing, we will continue to fight for this at UN level. We have um, uh, called for inputs from civil society and from local um, collectivities. And we have now a very substantive mass of documentation to document what is happening. And we will continue to put pressure on states so that they revise these regulations and do not um, criminalize the poor, but that they do effectively eradicate poverty. Many thanks indeed. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Tishita, for your leadership on this issue. It's going to be so important to so many countries, um, as well as that comparative study, which we're, we're really anxious to see on this issue. Uh, our next speaker could not join us in person here today, um, but Dominique Day, chair of the United Nations Working Group of Experts of People of African Descent, has provided a powerful video message on the inconsistencies of justice that exist around the world based on skin color, our ability to pay, gender identity, and other status that we will play now. I am Dominique Day, and I am the chair of the UN Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent. And I'm very pleased to be joining you here today for this important conversation. You know, we talk about equal protection under the law and lawyers like me feel a personal pride and an investment in that idea. And yet we know equality before the law has not existed in our lifetimes or in our memories. Moreover, the injustices of criminal legal systems the world over have important similarities. The fairness, accuracy, efficacy of criminal legal systems are frequently compromised jurisdiction to jurisdiction based on demographic qualities, race, financial status, sexual orientation, gender identity and expressions and sex characteristics are all correlated with lesser justice. With respect to people of African descent, we can catalog the racial disparities at every stage of the criminal process where data disaggregated by race exists. This is not by mistake. Contra to the contrary, we could argue it's by design. Criminal justice frameworks, tactics, legal instruments, investigative and prosecution techniques, and surveillance tools are exported all over the world by a small handful of wealthy and powerful countries. 
race itself is a transnational construct that has grown in parallel with our modern global economy. So we see surprising consistencies in the color and the shape of uh, injustice in criminal systems country to country. The perception that discretion is necessary to ensure community safety creates an opportunity to embed bias and diminished expectations into decision-making at every level of these systems for certain people on the basis of our skin color, uh, our ability to pay, our gender, our gender identity, our sex characteristics. Data has shown us that judges, police, teachers, doctors who think they are colorblind and immune from using race as a factor in deciding criminality are not. The use of discretion has become measurably a platform for systemic racism and the assumptions of legacy mindsets that go all the way back to the need to normalize racial atrocity in the trade and trafficking and enslaved Africans. This includes the historical practice of criminalizing blackness in various ways to justify surveillance, control, and the maintaining of privilege and power, maintaining of racial hierarchy. So even as we think of criminal systems as very local, Modern decision making is heavily influenced by transnational racial biases and modern tactics, equipment and practices, including the very language of our statutes that are imported from the US, from Europe, from the North. The use of discretion internally is reinforcing racial hierarchy transnationally. And we can measure this. We can measure it everywhere. We have data disaggregated by race. We can measure it qualitatively as we take walks through prisons and jails and even certain neighborhoods that are heavily policed in so many countries. So what do we do about this? What do we do? First, it is well past time to start using international forums such as this as truth telling spaces to discuss the realities and the urgency for authentic reforms. Second, data disaggregated, data disaggregated by race and other demographic factors is the only way to track whose human rights are being uh, obstructed and impacted by bias. Our ignorance in this regard has not protected us. Third, it is critical to use the expertise existing in each country and each community to understand how the use of discretion, how the export of criminal justice tactics and more may be feeding systemic racism intersectionally and may also be feeding the criminalization of people on the basis of their status. And finally, there is a clear need for a resolution to address the widespread criminalization of poverty race, ethnicity, and other status by countries around the world. It's an enormous task, and I stand ready to help uh, and offer my own services uh, to those who would uh, join me in this process. And uh, please do feel free to call on me uh, uh, if I may assist you as we move forward together. Thank you. Just a reminder to our remaining speakers to speak slowly so our interpreters can keep up. Um, and uh, I would like to introduce now uh, Natalie, Natalia Oliveira, who is the co-founder of the Black Initiative for a New Drug Policy in Brazil. We're so grateful to have Ms. Oliveira's voice on this panel, representing not only the brave civil society organizations that are on the front lines of the fight for justice around the world, um, but also the voice of Black-led social movements and the importance of including those with lived experience in the criminal justice reform movement. Ms. Oliveira, the, the floor is yours. Bom dia a todos e todas. Eu gostaria de agradecer a oportunidade em dialogar e conhecer mais sobre a realidade dos países, bem como apresentar a realidade que enfrentamos no Brasil. O Brasil é um caso brasileiro que, de criminalização da pobreza e das pessoas de cor num contexto de controle de drogas e a necessidade, e, e por isso nós somos a primeira organização negra no Brasil que aponta a necessidade de opções de reforma na política de drogas brasileira. 
construindo uma agenda de justiça racial a partir da reforma das políticas de drogas com agendas regionais, nacionais e internacionais. No Brasil, não há um projeto de compromisso com pessoas impactadas pela guerra às drogas. A depender da posição política do ocupante do cargo executivo, a política dos equipamentos de saúde se modifica e fragiliza, e em grande parte delas vai se apostando na no desmonte de equipamentos de atenção à saúde básica e essencial para as pessoas. Em contrapartida, também aposta-se na precariedade e na criminalização dos atores políticos, como nós, que se dispõem a ocupar os espaços de poder no Brasil. As comunidades negras, sobretudo as que vivem em áreas periféricas, estão sob, em áreas periféricas e regiões pobres, estão sob ataque constante, promovido em nome do modelo da guerra às drogas, com o medo de serem mortas por autoridades públicas, como as policias, mas também por outros agentes encorajados pela proposta de conflito permanente. A guerra é uma opção política e tem motivado o reforço do punitivismo racial e do controle territorial através do massacre que empurra a parte significativa da sociedade pela intensificação do medo. As cidades mais negras do, do Brasil, como Salvador e Rio de Janeiro, é, têm entre 100% e 89% dos mortos em operações policiais por pessoas negras. Esses dados são exemplos de como o racismo estrutural e institucional afetam a vida das pessoas negras e como a necropolítica é uma aposta do poder público afetado por territórios negros e pobres. A cada 23 minutos, um jovem negro é assassinado no Brasil. E as justificativas, por vezes, são as mesmas. Policiais dizendo que esses jovens se apoiaram em resistência à, à abordagem policial. Um outro exemplo grave que temos enfrentado no Brasil, relacionado à população de rua, e pessoas que são, fazem uso de cocaína fumada, é, está acontecendo exatamente neste momento na cidade de São Paulo, com uma forte perseguição no centro da cidade por diversas pessoas que estão em situação de rua. Desde o início desse mês, o prefeito da cidade de São Paulo, junto com o governador do estado de São Paulo, tem promovido uma perseguição a todas as pessoas que estão na rua, retomando, inclusive, propostas de internação compulsória desses sujeitos e encaminhamento forçado dessas pessoas para tratamento ou para o sistema de justiça. Enfrentamos no Brasil, e em especial na cidade de São Paulo, uma violência nunca antes acontecida nessa cidade. E tudo isso acontece às vistas de toda a, a população é, da a população e, com a, e mesmo com um forte poder da imprensa e outros veículos de comunicação, pressão dos movimentos sociais e até mesmo de parte do sistema da justiça, o prefeito da cidade diz que não vai recuar, pois ele aponta que a dispersão de cenas de uso de drogas é a melhor forma para o tratamento de cidadãos, quando, na verdade, o que está por trás disso é uma disputa de setores imobiliários por regiões centrais da cidade que tem alto valor, e essas pessoas pobres, neste momento, estão sendo usadas e violentadas em uma guerra que só se justifica na guerra às drogas. É urgente a intervenção da comunidade internacional na cidade de São Paulo, especialmente através da Secretaria, Internacional de Relações, da Secretaria de Relações Internacionais, pois uma pessoa foi, inclusive, assassinada na semana passada pela polícia civil por conta dessa, desse, desse movimento que o prefeito tem falado que as polícias devem fazer de dispersão de cenas de uso. Ontem também mais uma pessoa foi assassinada e ainda não foi averiguado se foi assassinada pela polícia. Isso nunca aconteceu na cidade de São Paulo. A cidade de São Paulo tem 12 milhões de habitantes é uma das cidades mais ricas de toda a América, e não é possível que, num momento em que estamos no maior período de inverno enfrentado na cidade, estamos no inverno muito frio aqui, e estamos já, inclusive, com pessoas que estão morrendo por conta do frio nas ruas da cidade. Precisamos de uma intervenção urgente para que isso não seja comum de acontecer. Em especial, peço uma atenção 
para as questões acontecendo na cidade de São Paulo nesse momento, pois é, toda a região central está vivendo uma espécie de batalha é, no meio da cidade e, com isso, a prefeitura tem fomentado, na opinião da população, de que a internação forçada e o aprisionamento de pessoas é a melhor solução para todos. E essa opinião vem crescendo na população, pois todos estão muito assustados com violências todos os dias no centro da cidade. É isso. Gostaria de agradecer e um bom dia. Thank you, Natalia, both for highlighting the real urgency of this crisis um, and how important it's going to be to include the voice of civil society in any effort to address it globally. Um, I'd now like to introduce our last panel speaker today, Dr. Janil Zarina Matthews. Uh, Dr. Matthews is a multidisciplinary criminal justice scholar and professor at the University of the West Indies. Dr. Matthews has researched and written extensively on the criminalization of poverty and status in the Caribbean, including on broad and vaguely worded colonial era vagrancy laws that have targeted and criminalized gender nonconforming persons. Dr. Matthews, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you. Um, good morning or good afternoon, as the case may be. Um, thanks so much for having me today. Uh, in my short time, I just wanted to quickly share with you an example from the Anglophone Caribbean and to leave you with one of my main takeaways from the strategic litigation that my colleagues and I were in, involved in and then tell you sort of a, a, what I think um, ought to happen um, as a result. So just to give you a little background, in 2009, seven young trans persons were arrested in Georgetown, Guyana, pursuant to the 1893 Summary Jurisdiction Act. They were arrested for loitering, and for the offense of being a man appearing in female attire in a public way or public place for an improper purpose. They were not told what they were being charged with at the time of their arrest or during their entire um, detention. They spent the weekend in the police station lockup and were taken collectively before the Georgetown Magistrates Court, even though they didn't know each other and they weren't connected to each other in any other way. Um, their cases were uh, heard uh, together and none of them were represented by counsel. Each person pleaded guilty to the gendered clothing offense, was convicted and ordered to pay a fine of approximately 36 US dollars. Um, and in hearing the case, the acting chief magistrate told the group of trans persons that they were confused about their sexuality and instructed them to go to church and to give their lives to Jesus Christ. Um, and after a year um, or so, the four of, four of them who were convicted along with a local NGO together with the support of pro bono attorneys and my colleagues filed a constitutional claim in the high court arguing that their constitutional rights had been infringed. After making it through the, um, the court system, we lost twice um, at first court, court of first instance and the uh, Court of Appeals. Um, but nearly 10 years later, um, the Caribbean Court of Justice unanimously ruled in a groundbreaking decision for the region that the gendered clothing offense was unconstitutionally vague and in a decision that would foreshadow the African court's 2020 decision um, that vagrancy laws in form and application enable the discriminatory treatment of marginalized persons and deprive persons of their rights to equality and dignity, the Caribbean Court of Justice criticized the law as being anachronistic, um, an anachronistic vagrancy law that was part of a body of laws that were aimed at keeping the dispossessed and depressed under control and found that the law left trans persons in great uncertainty as to what is and is not allowed. 
The court further found that imploring the appellants to give their lives to Jesus Christ was inappropriate proselytizing and revealed stereotypical thinking about um, transgendered persons. Um, and so this ruling, like that of the African court, is critical in recognizing where these laws came from and why. This colonial le era legislation governing um, these offenses that were enacted at a time when protecting the state was more important than protecting its people. Um, when the intention was to create a two-tiered society um, in which there were those who were ruled and those who ruled, um, in which there were those who were respectable and those who weren't, those who were good, those were, who were bad. Um, the judicial um, decision, I think, um, it, it sort of um, was a, a way of um, kind of bringing to fo the fore, um, bringing to the public's attention a lot of these um, issues. And I think that they were important and that, um, that the decisions were, are very important and that lawyers ought to uh, continue to challenge these laws and to craft arguments that facilitate these kinds of progressive decisions. But what I think this, um, this decision has taught me, however, is that we need more than litigation. To get this one law struck down in the Caribbean, it took us nearly 10 years. One of my colleagues um, famously joked that if we had given birth to, uh, at the start of this case, that by the time it actually went through the process to the um, Caribbean Court of Justice, uh, the child would be sitting exams for secondary school. Um, and so when you put it in that perspective, secondary school um, is a, a very long time. And so when you're dealing with a body of legislation with so many similar laws, striking them one at a time every 10 years, um, it, it feels as though you're just sort of, you know, trying to fill a, a bucket um, that has holes. Um, and so here I want to echo um, what the Caribbean Court of uh, Justice um, had uh, said um, in response to the state's uh, argument that they ought to be wary of judicial legislating, legislating from the bench. What the court says and what I'm calling on governments to do um, is that the best way to keep the judiciary out of the business of legislative reform is to do it yourself. Um, and here in the Caribbean on the heels of the royal visit and um, talk about becoming a republic and breaking from the monarchy like Barbados just did. I mean, I think this is a really good time to interrogate what, um, you know, doing the reform yourself actually looks like. Uh, because governments will say, well, it looks though that we are being soft on crime. Um, how can we just say we're wholesale repealing all of these laws that are meant to uh, keep us secure? And I think I think um, there needs to be within that conversation of what it means to be independent and apart from the monarchy, attention as to all of these absurd laws that exist. Um, laws like, you know, uh, in St. Kitts and Nevis and throughout the Anglophone Caribbean, you can go to prison for one month for saying curse words and swearing in public. Um, most middle-class people in the region don't believe that those laws exist. Uh, police officers in Guyana, where this case um, emerged um, outside of Georgetown told me that there was no such cross-dressing law in Guyana. Um, those who did know that the law existed said, but nobody ever enforces those laws. Nobody cares about those laws. And so, if there's a public education campaign around um, all of the, um, the, the laws that um, were meant to preserve the inequities and the iniquities bequeathed to us by the queen. Um, and talking about breaking from the queen, um, people would be more comfortable with um, getting rid or dismantling that framework that was meant to control us. Um, and, and we need to make the distinction between what is means to secure the state or what it means to 
um, yeah, to, to preserve safety or to ensure public safety um, by honoring the promises and aspirations of independence. So what I want to end on um, is the idea that governments ought to be focused on dismantling or decriminalizing these offenses, but with doing it with the will of the people. So with an eye towards educating the public um, as to what some of these laws are and why they need to be repealed and how that would make us all safer um, in a country that we have built and imagined um, from our ourselves. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Matthews. And before we wrap up and, and, and really kind of bring all this together into this year of action that we, we talked about bringing together, this isn't the end of the conversation, but really the beginning um, on how we can move forward together. I wanna to give the floor um, quickly to Anna Judici, who is um, with UNODC. And she's gonna talk a little bit about uh, an event that the UN put on earlier this week and, and what they are trying to do to address this issue of racial injustice around the world. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you all. And, and thank you to all the previous speakers. It's been a very interesting and enlightening uh, session. I, I really appreciated listening to you all. Um, I will just say a few words uh, from on behalf of UNODC and the Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice Section. First of all, uh, my colleague from uh, OHCHR has already shared with you the quotes and the link to the UN Common Position on Incarceration. Uh, which is clear on the need to shift the focus from punishment to prevention, rehabilitation, restorative justice, and social reintegration, and also calls on a movement towards depenalization and decriminalization in appropriate cases in line with international standards. And UNODC has a key role in supporting member states in reviewing both their criminal laws and their penal policies to ensure they are in line with international human rights law, UN standards and norms, but also new developments around the world. So this is something that we do on an ongoing basis and we will continue to do so. As I've mentioned uh, also in the chat, uh, I lead a team working on equal access to justice for all in line with uh, SDG goals 5, 10 and 16 in particular. And our focus is very much on uh, centering those that have that we in UN lingo tend to to call uh, those at risk of being left uh, behind, but actually in more direct language, those that face discrimination, exclusion, and and uh, historic uh, injustices. Um, and in this regard, we work on access to legal aid. We have a strong program in line with the UN principles and guidelines uh, on legal aid as well as on reforming and modernizing police institutions. We've heard about police violence today. Again, this is a key aspect of addressing um, like, yeah, uh, in discrimination and, and uh, use of force and the, the role of the criminal justice system that should shift from being an oppressive force to um, uh, service at the, at the service of communities. Uh, we also work on other aspects like restorative justice and support to victims of crime. A uh, new area of work is that of hate crime, which was uh, included in the Kyoto Declaration of the Crime Congress uh, uh, last year. And finally, as, as uh, Jennifer mentioned, as I also mentioned in the chat, um, UNODC is the lead of the criminal justice pillar of the UN uh, network on uh, racial discrimination and protection of minorities. And as such, we've worked very closely with OHCHR and other UN agencies on advancing our joint, uh, joint work in this area. Uh, and most recently, we had a high level event this week with uh, Ms. Speshley, Ms. Wali, uh, the Deputy Secretary General, uh, Ms. Nadal Nashif, as well as uh, other high level speakers. If you listen to the recording, you will hear a bit more about what we are doing uh, in this area of addressing uh, racial discrimination and uh, responding to it within the system, but also ensuring access to justice for victims of racial discrimination and making our systems more uh, 
diverse and representative of the communities they serve. So thank you very much. And thank you to the co-organizers and to all the speakers on behalf of the NLDC. Thank you so much, Anna. And thank you to all of our amazing panelists today um, for, in Dominique Day's words, um, doing some truth telling, right? Talking about what's, what's actually happening um, and inspiring us to, to work together to take action. We're gonna be reaching out to all of the amazing participants that joined uh, this event who work on these issues around the world. We are going to be looking at whether we can bring together an expert group that would that would look at these issues um, across countries, um, learn from each other, um, think about um, actions that need to be taken, and particularly um, to really push the Commission on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice um, to be doing more, to be having these conversations, to be taking concrete um, action, um, and maybe even encouraging member states to bring a resolution that calls on them collectively to take action to repeal discriminatory laws, to stop the use of discretion um, that, that, um, that, that criminalizes individuals based on poverty and other status, um, and that, that encourages them, really requires them to engage in data collection so that we can really understand what's going on and how laws are being used around the world. Thank you again for joining. We look forward to staying in touch with everyone. Have a wonderful weekend.